Welcome to the ninth episode of Dialogica. I'm Stephanie. And I'm Sweden. And this week we're talking about... The Manaha and the various scandals they're embroiled in right now. Which is mostly about money. As is most political scandals in Indonesia. So yeah, money politics in Indonesia, which we're also going to delve into a little bit. And we're going to explain what the scandal is all about and how it's tied into some of AHA's other controversial scandals. And part of this is our ongoing conversation about AHA and how to hold him accountable. We're going to also talk about the equivalent of Taman Ahok, basically Obama for America. And we're going to explain about the concept of PACs and super PACs and why we think it could be a model for Taman Ahok. And finally, we're going to wrap it up with how we see the future is for Taman Ahok and how they can help us democratic citizens hold our leaders accountable. Here's to it! So I guess we start off with what exactly is going on uh, with regards to Tamanaho and why are they suddenly popping up all over the place in unsavory terms mm-hmm. over various um, newspapers. Yeah, I mean, if you live in Jakarta, you've seen um, logos of Tamanaho. So they're basically all the people in the malls and the booths looking for katapes or ID cards to ha- support Ahok's independent governorship candidacy. Mm-hmm. They've made a pledge um, a few months ago saying we're going to collect 1 million ID cards as proof mm-hmm. that there's enough of a support for Ajo's independent run. and Which is interesting because technically in order for any independent candidate to run, they only need a little bit over 500,000 signed cards or whatever. Oh, really? Yeah. I think there are different like rules in legislation as well. Like we, There's also... Rules say that it needs to need it needs to have matrai or like. A... Oh yeah, some sort of like notarized proof or whatever, yeah. right? Uh-huh. What I do know is that it's not actually you don't actually need one million ID cards. Yeah, so they're That's being overzealous. Goal. Yeah, they're being overzealous and making like uh, almost like a political point, right? Yeah. That there is enough movement yeah. to um, elect Aho no matter what. As of recording this, they're five thousand shy of yeah. one million. Very so. close. And I guess the controversy or more of the unsavory news started with the. Well, it's been going on for a while, but what really added that grievance is some legitimacy is Tempo's article or cover on Tamanahok and the scandal or scandal quotation marks that had to do with Tamanahok. So according to the Tempo article, the first person to make the allegations against Tamanahok is a PDIP politician, Junimart Kirsang, who alleges that Tamanahok has received about 30 billion Indonesian rupiah via Sanitan Wijaya who is a close staffer of Ahok and a close advisor of Ahok. And Hassan Asbi of Sirius Network. And Sirius Network is a political consulting firm in Jakarta. Why how is this linked to Taman Ahok is because Sunny, along with Hassan Asbi, is considered the pioneers or the founders of Taman Ahok. And about 10 billion of this 30 billion has been attributed, according to Junimart, to PT Agung Podomoro Land and PT Agung Sedaya Group, both giant land developers who are currently embroiled in the reclamation scandal. Jirumar mm-hmm. alleges that this 10 billion rupiah was given in exchange for the reclamation licenses. And he claims that he got this source directly from a Taman Ahok turncoat or defector who became disillusioned with the fact that Taman Ahok is full of opportunists and people who just want to get money. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, he has turned in all of this documents to KPK and BPK to have Taman Ahok be audited and found essentially of wrongdoing. Uh, Hassan Nasbi denied the fact that the Manahok got their initial seed funding from Podomoro Land or other conglomerates, but he himself funded 500 million rupiah to fund to start funding the Manahok. Mm-hmm. The Manahok officially, at least based on their based, based on their website, started in early to mid-2015, mm-hmm. and they have actually released um, financial reports mm-hmm. every month since mid-2015. Mm-hmm. So they've been trying really hard to legitimize themselves, making sure they're transparent. Mm-hmm. But you know, part of the question right now is, mm-hmm. for an organization that always claims itself as volunteer-driven mm-hmm. and committed to an independent route for AHA mm-hmm. towards governorship, now people are starting to think, are they really as independent as they yeah. say they are? What is the Manahok? What kind of organization is this? I think it's something that a lot of people in Indonesia, this is unprecedented waters, right? In a way, mm-hmm. because there hasn't been any outside the party political organization that's as vocal and as 
in public as Tamanahok is. Yeah. So I think Tamanahok is also more uh, familiar to people like us who studied American politics and there exist super PACs and PACs and those kind of organizations so we're like oh the banahox sort of like a super pack so it's not mm-hmm. really a big deal but a lot of people don't know what it is so what is it say so, right. putting you on the spot super pack in 30 I, seconds so what is a pack and super pack right um, pack stands for political action committee and they're basically independent organizations that are not tied to a campaign or candidate mm-hmm. and they exist in order to collect money and then donate it to these causes. So, for example, let's say you want to make a, a pack called Unicorns Allied for Obama. You can do that. Yeah, you just need to fill out the paperwork. So, let's say we use this example, Unicorns Allied <laughs> against... Uh, I, did make, I did just make that up. I'm very <laughs> proud of myself. As you should be. Um, so, this pack, Unicorns Allied for Obama. Mm-hmm. Um, as a pack, they have three particular regulations essentially donation thresholds. Mm-hmm. They can only donate up to 5000 to a particular candidate. Mm-hmm. They can only donate up to 15000 to a particular party. Mm-hmm. And they can only donate up to 5000 to another pack. Mm-hmm. So that's how you sort of like, that's how you keep the packs in check in yeah. America. So the unicorns can like call up their unicorn buddies and be like, hey, we're unicorns allied for Obama. Can we all donate to this particular pack? And then mm-hmm. we collect all the money from all the unicorns and then we can have them support Obama. And that's pack- how that's essentially how it works and like anybody can make one and it's not very difficult just fill out the paperwork yeah and packs are all about you know being issue driven as well so mm-hmm. like if you're the unicorns you care only about obama like, says that unicorns are cool yeah then they can be like yeah obama's our candidate so we and can- and you fight for unicorn issues right yeah and you know these are sometimes issues that the candidate themselves can't always take mm-hmm. on full time. Mm-hmm. So you as the pack, you want to be like, we need to make sure unicorn issues are on the front page. And all the unicorns are supportive and knowing of Obama. Uh, and a super pack is. So what's interesting about the super PAC mm-hmm. is that there's no uh, there's no cap in spending, mm-hmm. but the sort of like the drawback, mm-hmm. the downside is that you cannot contribute directly to a candidate or a party. But uh, you can, however, fill up the airspace with your ads. Uh, so, so you like, can't. So let's say um, there's a super pack for Hillary, mm-hmm. and um, they are not allowed to give money to the Hillary campaign directly. No. but they can make their own thing. They can run their ads. Okay. So it's like if should the unicorn ally for Obama become a super pack, mm-hmm. they cannot directly donate to Obama, mm-hmm. but they can run these ads that say we are for Obama. Okay. <laughs> Paid for Which by is- the super pack. <laughs> Which is basically kind of similar, right? Kind of similar. It's just like a little bit of a loophole, right? Yeah. The candidate and the party themselves don't yeah. get the actual cash. Yeah. But the net benefit is still for yeah. them. So this is more money raising for the political campaigning. So the mm-hmm. Ahok doesn't actually raise money for to campaign for Ahok yet. Yet. But the, I, foreseeably, they could very well do that. I think that's part of a conversation that the Manaha has about themselves. Yeah. Right now, they're focused on getting the 1 million um, ID cards. Mm-hmm. What's next? What's next? Nobody, I think, really knows, especially mm-hmm. right now when there's all this scandal around them. Like, how involved do they want to yeah. be beyond that, right? And you mentioned before that the Manaha is actually very similar to OFA, Obama for America. Yes. So, um, Obama for America is an interesting example and potential model for the Manaha. Mm-hmm. Um, it started out as the grassroots activist section. Mm-hmm of the Obama 2008 campaign. Mm -hmm. And then once Obama got elected, they became Organizing for America, keeping Mm -hmm. the same acronym, OFA. Mm -hmm. But now they became the grassroots segment of the DNC, the Democratic National Committee. OFA has always been explicit about working with the DNC Mm -hmm. because they knew that that was the only ticket, right? Yeah, but they were also very much outside of the party. Yes. And so, like, they the mobilized the young voters. Mm-hmm. They were able to get people to work for them on a volunteer yeah. basis. Yeah. Something that a party, Cannot do. especially in America, has become increasingly hard to do yeah. because they're so bogged down in whatever the establishment means that they don't connect with the voters anymore. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think there's a similarity with the Manaha. Yeah. Like us individuals. The I don't know how to participate in party politics. That is true. Nor do I want to, uh, in yeah. all honesty. So, like, how do I participate Not in. Be yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah. Um, how do you participate in uh, helping your That's candidate? Yeah. 
get elected, yeah. you go through the manna, something like the yeah. manna. So which that's is, that's the which, benefit of it. Which is funny because I think we as political nerds, like I think we face a lot of pressures from our friends, like saying, to participate, like, participate, and they're like. Why aren't you volunteering for the Manahawk? Especially you, because you have useful talents. I'm more <laughs> useless. You're a graphic designer. You can be useful. I'm always I just, like... I just sit there and opine. Like, <laughs> and you just watch me squirm. Yes. Um, I'm always a, just but a little this bit is like, skeptical. Yeah, I've seen like Sudian get grilled by several friends. Like, why aren't you volunteering? I know. And I'm like, I just... I don't... I'm skeptical about where it's all going to go because we're not exactly sure. Yeah. Uh, what's the future? I mean, I'm, I'm actually... You know, as skeptical as I am of the Manaho, I'm glad they exist. Yeah. Part of my skepticism is making sure that they don't just exist to then be subsumed by yeah. a party. I, like, I don't want them to be like a tech firm that gets eaten up by like a Facebook or Google, right? Yeah, that's, that's, that's the true. equivalent. Uh-huh. So I want to make sure they actually still commit to their grassroots activism mm-hmm. roots mm-hmm. and still want to make sure that a candidate is elected because yeah. of their ideals instead of party allegiance. And I really like this idea that uh, sure, they're going to help him campaign and everything, but they need to help him, you know, stay the help that people vote for. Yeah. I think what's also, what puts Tim and Aho in a difficult place is that Aho himself isn't necessarily like all gung-ho for them in the way that Barack Obama was for OFA. I guess one of our misgivings about Ahok is, as we talked about and covered in our Ahok Part 1 Kalijoro episode, oftentimes when he treats people, he can be very callous and mm-hmm. um, doesn't really care about their needs. Yeah. So for example, there was this one old grandma who he shouted at because she complained her problem to him about, you know, the fact that she was being evicted. Mm-hmm. And he like was got so angry. He hit his hand on his car mm-hmm. and you know, just a general tantrum, right? And like yeah. how I guess how he's it really bothers me like that just the position between how he's portrayed as a populist, but is at the same time he can be very almost cruel or I, I imagine the manahaw as like the son or the puppy that's just like dad love me like why don't why don't you come like you know I'm trying my best for you and they're I like know. oh you're just like putting your arm at a distance what's wrong <laughs> yeah. I think he's very stubborn right about yeah. his ways and it's almost like you mm-hmm. need to move aside because he knows better he's not the type of person to feel beholden to Anybody. gratitude or parties or people mm-hmm. There's this idea that he is kuto lonjat, right? Like he's definitely the jumping flea. Jumping flea. <laughs> oh, I love Indonesian idioms. But basically, most political operators in Indonesia are uh, loyal, quote, quote, to the party. So they stay in one party, or at least they make one move. But Ahok is the exception. He started off as the Bupati of Bangka Belitung in the now defunct Partai Indonesia Baru (PIB). They are defunct because they never passed the parliamentary threshold again. And then he moved to Golkar as a member of DPR or parliament member for them, and also then moved to Gurindra. I remember him like publicly tearing apart his Gurindra letter mm-hmm. in, in front of camera, which really incensed Prabowo. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, and I think part of the appeal, and it's like a double edged sword, right? Because Ahok's appeal is he's very off the cuff and he's very, I don't care what people think. At the same time, he's not very tactful as a person, so. No. That's what people love and hate about him and why he, I think he's quite a polarizing figure. And consequently, the organization he touches becomes in, invites polarity. But he's using Tamanaha almost as leverage. Just yeah. like, you guys can help me insofar as... Getting the katepe. He's putting Tamanaha at an arm's length, right? Like saying that um, they're independent. They are not working directly with them. We've met like maybe twice, like three times, but they're like an outside independent agency which gives the Manahok a very large platform but I feel like at the same time currently they don't really know what to do with the platform and I don't know if they exactly have thought about what's next What's also interesting with about Manaho right now in particular is that, right, like we said earlier, they were committed towards an independent route for Aho. Mm-hmm. But as they've continued growing, mm-hmm. they're realizing that 
even Naha himself has said, would the Manaha prefer him to go run the independent route, which is a harder route, or to be backed by political parties, by existing political parties? So the idea is that political parties in Indonesia are allowed to raise money and uh, for their candidates, and they're allowed to raise that money in a myriad of ways. So we actually looked into this, and we found out there are a lot of regulations on campaign financing in Indonesia, actually. So after 1998 and Suharto's regime, what happened in Indonesia's political party financing system was that they decided that the parties should be funded through three different ways. One is that the political parties had large membership base, right? So Mm -hmm. PKB, PDIP, Golkar, PAN, they had millions and millions of members. Mm -hmm. So people were encouraged to become a member and then donate, let's say, 50,000 rupiah to the party. And this should be a base for the party to have some kind of revenue and base for which they can have their political activities. Yes. Way number two was that there were cap donations, similar to what we conventionally have today. And way number three was that actually the government gave a large budget to the parties, X amount of money in order to have all their campaigns. So that way the political parties don't have the burden or the urge to fundraise from individuals, but they have that money from the government. Especially during a time when it's transitioning out of Suharto's regime, right? Mm -hmm. They do recognize the fact that we have a fragile democracy. We mm-hmm. need to somehow equalize in a way, or equalize. put people on the same level, and at least at least get people to participate in politics, right? Yeah, to join the parties. Yeah, so the grassroots is based by people joining, um, mm-hmm. becoming a member of a political party, but the state still had some influence in terms of like having a base there in case the Iran or the membership fees weren't enough. Yeah, so that was from ninety eight, and then during after around ten years in. President Yudoyono's presidency, he decided to cut this state funding dramatically. In 2005, he so, actually cut it by almost 90% yeah. public funding. And that obviously hit the parties hard. Mm-hmm. In a time when also, during that period... Increasing new media expenditures and different ways that people are engaged. And campaigning. And campaigned. Um, so that's a big change, right? So arguably, it destabilized the political party system and really pushed parties even more so to get backroom dealings from conglomerates or backroom, private, donations. private donations yeah because memberships like there's a rapid decline in memberships mm-hmm. and how big can you make a membership fee right yeah and i think the idea was that people's political allegiances became very tenuous so people mm-hmm. moved and voted for different parties based on different candidates and they they didn't have the strong link as people used to to one particular party yeah uh, especially the young people, maybe the old voters, you know, that certain provinces in Indonesia are like Bedepe strongholds or Golka strongholds and more urban areas with younger voters, this kind of like legacy declined somewhat. So, and In fact, I think it transformed into something a little bit more skeptical. Yeah, and I think that needed more campaigning, right? This mm-hmm. idea that you need to engage the voters through political ads, through media, through social media, just all this new ways or formats of how to reach your target voters at the same time it became more and more expensive and the government perhaps maybe rightly so they don't want to necessarily spend all their taxpayer monies on funding political yeah parties. i mean why are you gonna try fund political parties when they have ways to fund that and instead fund education or healthcare or infrastructure yeah. projects right so but, i mean it's not it makes sense but it also had other implications yeah it obviously drove the parties towards backroom deals mm-hmm. and so i mean to be fair to the government they have tried to regulate but, you know... Um, it's hard to crack down. It's hard to crack down. In fact, um, there's a couple of reports, one mm-hmm. in particular by the Harvard Kennedy School, mm-hmm. cited that Indonesia is actually, in terms of campaign financing mm-hmm. law, is an interventionist mm-hmm. system. So the government actually intervenes and mm-hmm. tries to regulate campaign finances. Mm-hmm. But the reality is, we hardly see any attempt or yeah. any real tangible results yeah. from the so-called regulation. Yeah, Parties mm-hmm. still approach conglomerates and they are friends of friends of friends Mm -hmm. for you know payments but this is part of this conversation about like how are campaigns being uh, run run and being financed it's a big and important question we need to ask because if everything is not transparent we don't know the behind the scenes backroom dealing that's Mm -hmm. going on without our knowledge and without our consent 
So if a particular candidate receives a lot of money from particular conglomerates, and then we see a decision that maybe one year from you know the person is elected is beneficial to this conglomerate, we might say like, oh, I don't know why, maybe there's no link. But if we know a certain candidate got a lot of money from this conglomerate, then we can be more. You can hold them accountable. Yeah, we can hold them accountable for this kind of like. Is there any kind of like handshake deal? So that the idea is, if we are a democracy, it's kind of unfair to have certain people with more power and money exert more undue influence towards a candidate that we all voted for, right? Mm-hmm. So if a certain candidate that we all voted for equally it represents a rich person more, that means our vote means less yeah. in a way, right? Like that is true. We elected them, but they're not representing our interests. They're only representing the interests of the people who gave them money. Mm-hmm. And that's counterintuitive to the idea of democracy. Yeah. Whether or not you like democracy, it's just a flaw in the logic. <laughs> I was still like unicorn's ally for Obama. But I love that. Can yeah. that be like the title? Episode? How misleading, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. And credits as usual to Brooke Murphy, Jazz Art, and Ryan Little. Please visit our website at dialogica.id for resources and links, as well as our previous episodes. Yeah, there have been some pretty good ones, I think. So give us a listen. And follow us and like us on Facebook and Instagram. And subscribe to us on the Apple uh, Podcast app at Dialogica Podcast. Cool. Well, catch you next time.